You've tuned in to Irish Illustrated Insider. This is Tim Priester with Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated, joined by Pete Sampson from The Athletic and Pete's children in the background as well. It's Monday, February 15th, and not a lot of huge news really to report with regard to Notre Dame football, though Notre Dame put out a release here recently naming Brian Poley the associate head coach, special teams. Uh, well, he was special teams coordinator. That now belongs to Mike Elston, who is defensive line coach, recruiting coordinator, run game coordinator on defense, just to clarify. Um, uh, guys, I mean, I think we all understand. We've seen this many times before. This is a this is how you give coaches raises and keep them on your coaching staff. Yeah, I think stability is good here. Um, I think both those guys are good coaches, good recruiters. Um certainly add to Notre Dame as a program. Um, I get, I thought the recruiting coordinator change was a little interesting just because I think Pullian has probably one of the better senses um, at Notre Dame of like fit for Notre Dame. Um, I think he did a good job over the last three plus years, but I think Elston did a good job before that too. So it's, um, I, I guess I thought that was sort of an interesting flip flop, but you know, I, in some ways, I just, I just sort of expected them to have their contracts extended and get raises without titles changing. Right. You wonder if, um, as Brian Kelly kind of talked about associate head coach before, it grooms you to be a head coach, and Polians would be, again, a head coach. But um, maybe there it is just better for Brian Polian's career that you're associate head coach doing those duties. He does retain special teams coordinator duties. And if you're associate head coach and special teams coordinator, you probably cannot be the recruiting coordinator as well in terms of your everyday life. And Pete, you mentioned it, I think a few years ago, I was surprised when Mike Elston was no longer the special teams coordinator because he coordinated things so well in that realm as well. Um, So yeah, it's, it's raises. (laughs) It comes down to raises and probably a little more than we know behind the scenes what associate head coaches do. Sure. Yeah. I don't want to diminish what their responsibilities will be, but by the same token, it it makes no sense for Brian Poling to disassociate himself with the whole recruiting process. Yeah. Mike Elston can learn from him. Uh, and he can learn from Mike Elson about the duties that were entailed with the associate head coaching uh, title. But, you know, it, 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 in the college football world today, it's a titles game. And that's, I mean, everyone does that, including, you know, you endow positions to people that are willing to pay the, the uh, you know, the cost of a, de- a defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, position coach, et cetera. And I think the run game coordinator thing is becoming more prevalent. I noticed this is because I was looking to see where he was now. Anthony Weaver, you know, the ex Notre right. player. When he moved to the Bills from Houston, he also gained the title of run game coordinator. And like a lot of our readers, I had to look it up. I was like, why is he the run game coordinator when he's been a defensive coach his whole life? Of course, that means rush defense coordinator. I think a lot of teams are doing that now. Like, it, you know, Lance Taylor's the running game coordinator for Notre Dame. People don't think of that. He's the co op, that he is the co op coordinator. I, I think a lot of. It must just be more separate entities now. It allows Marcus Freeman to do other stuff, and Elston drills but down the, on that. Like, are the, it, does anybody on Notre Dame coaching staff reference Lance Taylor as the co-offensive coordinator? I mean, they don't. No, they and, don't acknowledge it either in discussing it with us. And they kind of did when it was Denbrock and Sanford, right? A little bit more, would you say? Sanford yeah, Sanford was think, so young. I, I think right. that may have had a lot to yeah. do with it. Yeah. No, I think that and. I don't know if that changes up the off season for Elston, where maybe you have some more responsibility to do research into different approaches to defend the run game mm-hmm. or how you stand up uh, in those instances. I, I'm not really sure um, how that all fits together. I would just, you know, both of them are value adds for Notre Dame. At the, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, I, I again, the, the, there are always going to be those that question absolutely everything Notre, Notre Dame does, but I don't think that Notre Dame is going to be, you know, worse off with, with, with recruiting with Elston as a, as a recruiting coordinator. As you said, he's, he's done it before. Um, I think everything will be fine. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't anticipate anything sliding in a, in a backwards direction because of a change of these titles. I think we've talked enough about this. I mean, that that's about, this will be the last time that we probably ever talk about it, other than how we reference <laughs> those coaches. It's going to yeah. be longer. When you say Mike Elston, it's going to take a little bit longer to, to rattle off all the responsibilities or at least the titles. But uh, anyway, so uh, good for those guys. Good for Notre Dame. Um, a lot of people were concerned that Mike Elston would lead Notre Dame to become a defensive coordinator. Notre Dame got the best of both worlds. You got Marcus Freeman, a great defensive coordinator, and you still have Mike Elston yeah. uh, as your as your defensive line coach. 
you know, not a ton going on right now. And that's why we're going to talk about basketball in this segment. But, you know, I mean, like, oh, boy, I can't wait till Notre Dame plays Florida in 2031 and 2032. <laughs> uh, I'll be walking. I'll definitely be walking with a cane if I'm at those games. <laughs> You guys are a little bit different situation, but, uh, you know, Florida is just another, at least as it, as it stands right now, another quality program being added to the, the, uh, the schedule moving forward. Yeah. When you're doing the math and you figure out, all right, so 2031 would be Sloan's senior year of college and <laughs> 2032 would be Tate's freshman year of college. Like, Will Sloan be in the stu- senior student section at Notre Dame? Will Tate be making the road trip to Gainesville? How will all, all this work? Will we drive together? Um, it's uh, it's pretty abstract. I mean, I love, you know, a couple of people hit me up on Twitter and be like, you know, wasn't last year an indication that you can schedule these games on the fly? And like, you know, I, as Sorbrick, I think, mentioned on this podcast to you guys, like when there's ample planes and hotel rooms, yeah, you can do it right away. But, or, but that's not how it's going to be back then. And also, like, Florida's going to be a good brand name yes, then good. as it is now, sure, as it is in sure. six years, as it was six years ago. And that's whether they're going 7-5 and five or 12-1. and one. Like, that's a game you really want to see. And uh, as somebody else pointed out on Twitter, I can't believe Florida's coming to Notre Dame in November where it was 69 degrees for Clemson to show up and play yeah. some football. <laughs> it's, you don't know what you're going to get in that terms, in those temperatures. But speaking of uh, quick scheduling, Notre Dame basketball, uh, Pete and Tim, they're in a bit of a bind here because losing Clemson this week. Yeah, the Clemson game they on needed that win. postponed. Yeah, They needed that win desperately. Clemson's a winning, a 13-5 and team with a winning ACC record. It was going to be a Notre Dame home game where there's slight favorites and it would look good to win. It would bring them to 500. You'd be way more into the committee's eyes as 500 winning seven out of nine in the ACC going from 0 and 5. I mean, you are, you're looking at on firmly in like the last four out bubble range right there, depending on what you do the rest of the year. And yeah, now they probably, need a game. It probably forces you to win an extra game now. Yeah, and, and they're trying know. to I talk, I listen to Mike Bray today on the um, ACC media Zoom call. They're trying to get North Carolina for Wednesday. Um, it's going to be difficult because North Carolina has played six home games all year, and they might not want to travel again for another road game. They've just had so many issues. Um, and they're obviously isn't going to go there because they already played and lost by right. one point in North Carolina. He then offhandedly mentioned, and this might've just been him being desperate. He's like, well, I don't know, maybe a big East team can come in. He wants a, he wants a program to come in, Sure, you know, as good as Clemson's to. Uh, no, understandable. And you know, they are playing such quality basketball right now. I, you know, I know Miami, has really struggled, but Miami had just defeated Duke like Notre Dame did, and they took Virginia Tech to overtime. So Miami was playing better. They were supposed to get Chris Likes back a point guard, yeah. and he re- re-injured his ankle, which was you know kind of a break for Notre Dame. But uh, you know Miami gave him a run, um, and Notre Dame did what they've been doing in six, the really seven of the last eight games. They played yeah. real quality defense down the stretch. Nick Jogo had his either his best game in Nordam uniform or his second best game in a Nordam uniform. I would say best because best it was for sure. The other well, one doesn't well rounded in the 21 <laughs> yeah. point. Well, the BC game, yeah. uh, but it was more well-rounded. Right. He had seven rebounds, three on the offensive end. He had three assists. He protected the best way. He played great defense. He guarded their seven foot center and he guarded their six, six, three guard down yeah. the stretch when they were trying to preserve the lead. The BC game while great for him, yeah, it was like when Jonathan People stood there and hit a bunch of threes wide open, you know, and it was right. like, oh my god, they could shoot. This was a this was a heck of a basketball game by Nick Jogo, and they would have lost without him because nothing was really working for the first thirty minutes, other than Jogo, and then Lashevsky scored whatever twelve of his fourteen in the final ten right. minutes and was playing ball again. I mean, I I think they would have been a solid seven eight points behind without his well, contributions. Figure, yeah, I mean, they would have lost this game many times over this year, when you consider their two big men were in foul trouble immediately, right? They shot seven for 29 from three and Cormac Ryan twisted his ankle. He came back three minutes later, but didn't score again. So, I mean, with all those things going against them, Jogo steps up with comes up clutch down the stretch. They're just playing good basketball. I, you know, I realize that the record is, is still pretty ugly and they have a lot of ground to make up, but I, I feel the same way I did at the end of last year. They're playing like an NCAA, like an NCAA tournament team. They may not have, they ultimately may not have the resume to make that claim, but once again in February they're playing like an NCAA tournament team. I just feel like it's time for them to step up and 
not fall short on this run. Remember when they were playing like an NCAA tournament team last year and they went to Wake Forest and Olivier Saar just made it look like a cross between Kareem and Shaq against Mooney and Durham. And it was like, this team can't go to the NCAA tournament playing like that. They, they only have, because of the hole they dug, I think they're allowed one more loss this year where you look at it and go, you know what? They lost at Louisville. Louisville's better than them. Louisville's great on defense. Yeah, loss I'd, I'd rather it be there than Florida State at home yes. in the last regular beat season. Game. Flor- defend your home court and beat Florida State at home and get a ranked win. That and then if you, it's okay to lose one game to to uh, Louisville of the last six. That's, Isn't that the thing? Like you really want to you want to see them beat somebody better than them? Well, since I mean, they've that, lost twenty eight straight time. to yeah, yeah. since they've lost twenty eight straight time. to ranked teams. Yeah, absolutely. Florida, Florida, Florida State would count. State. Florida State would do it. Yeah, yeah. And, I agree. And, I, and I don't think it's. It's not the Florida State of last year, so it's a it's a more beatable Florida State team. They play them on March sixth. O'Malley, you're going to have to go to that game again. I'm going to be in. I'm going to be out of town, so you're going to. Have well, you to know, go Clemson. The streak was on the line. I know they beat Duke, but I have still not seen a live win. And I was headed to Clemson, and it gets postponed. I can't see a live win, no matter what I do. <laughs> all right, we'll be talking uh, all football in segment two coming up. Burning up the boards. Thank you for listening to the Irish Illustrated Insider Podcast. If you enjoy our coverage of Notre Dame football, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. Go to irishillustrated.com slash support. Your support will help Irish Illustrated continue to be the leader in coverage of Notre Dame athletics. Segment two, burning up the boards. We start with a question from Jay Chelinick. Are you concerned about having Brian Kelly's recruiting apologists in charge of Notre Dame recruiting. I am, meaning Jay Chalanek. Are you concerned about that? We're the guys mm-hmm. in charge. They're the same people in charge of Notre Dame recruiting for the last few years. Yeah. Elston and Napoleon have been doing this I, the whole I time. Think, I, think our, I think he was just trying to be funny. But, I, yeah. you know, I mean, I, you know what? I mean, what are, assist- what are coaches supposed to do? Man, you know, it was orchestrated. We talked about that. It but- was. I – I got to say this again. I forgot going in and immediately realized it was a national signing day press conference. We just got all excited because they said, we're going to talk to four Notre Dame assistants, including Marcus Freeman. We thought it was like this big media opportunity. And then I remembered they're just there to celebrate themselves, but that's what they normally do in December. They just did it in February, but that's like what they do to wrap up every class. And they chose this time to do it. You know, I gave up on that one as soon as I heard the first couple paragraphs when they were speaking. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that Notre Dame knows it needs to find another gear in recruiting and whether they come out and say it every press conference almost doesn't even matter. Cause I know internally that's acknowledged and understood and they're working on it. Um, I almost feel like it's, you know, it gets to a point it's not the same thing, but it's similar. It's like, how many times do we need to ask Brian Kelly about like reinventing himself after 2016 and like all the changes that he made, like the recruiting changes to aren't nearly that dramatic, but there are some tweaks and adjustments. And I, I don't think that their Notre Dame is necessarily inclined to discuss them all the time, even on signing day. Um, so I don't, I, I'm not, I guess to answer the question, I'm not concerned um, only because I believe that Notre Dame knows like, all right, there's another gear here. We got to find it. Um, and they're working toward it. They have known that for a while, though, however. Yes. Um, you know, and it just takes it just takes a little bit more, and uh, I think they're pushing in that direction. But, uh, you know, uh, I mean, apologists representing Notre Dame, that's, that, that's what you want in support of the head coach, uh, maybe not on the outside, but on the inside. CMU Penn Spain, if Kyle Hamilton is the most important player on defense this year, who would you place number two? I thought this was an interesting question because when 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 CMU Penns fan says important, I mean Kyle Hamilton. Kyle Hamilton's the best defensive player by far, not even close, no doubt about it. I'm not really sure who the best. I mean, I, you can argue for Drew White, uh, you can argue for uh, you know a couple of the interior defensive linemen, but who's the most important? I mean, I, I look at. You know, Isaiah Foskey has to become a big time pass rusher now. Tariq Bracey, they really need him to be a competent starting cornerback. Houston Griffith, they really need him to be a competent starting safety. I don't know. I, there's nobody to, is there anybody to put into the class of Kyle Hamilton from that perspective? No, but no, Foskey, Foskey was easily my choice. Yeah, Foskey was easily my choice for the most important after Kyle Hamilton because he has to be. 
I mean, he has to be better than the defensive ends were. Well, he has he has to outproduce mm-hmm. what Dalen Hayes did because Dalen Hayes did a lot of things well, but he has to outproduce what Dalen Hayes did. He has to be better than he ever was rushing the passer, and he's got to be consistent. He's he has just to be, be the good he has to be the pass rushing threat that Julian O'Carr was most of the time. I um, one Fosky is who I would put on the list, um, but I think you could you could argue for MTA um, as a guy who you know. Is, go from maybe a late round pick to a mid round yes. third round pick. I mean, if that happened, if, I mean, if you, if you told me MTA was a third round pick a year from now, I mean, that, <laughs> that would really change my perception of like what this defense could be. Cause that would be um, a destructive, not just a space eating defensive tackle, a guy who's making a ton of plays. And if that, if you have a playmaking defensive tackle, man, that makes up for a lot of, a lot of stuff elsewhere in your defense yeah it's, it's kind of like stop being solid be more time for mta is that a fair way to say it it is i don't think i don't necessarily think he has that kind of ability to be a third round draft choice but you, no you're right i mean that's the situation they're in they need him to be that um you know you do have some guys behind him that can play well there's a lot of guys up there that's why it's hard to name one of those like they're all gonna play mm-hmm. don't you think i think they're gonna go super deep again in the line like three deep rolling it out well, that's my, I mean, you know, is Marcus Freeman going to handle that the same way Clark Lee did? That, that's a, that's, that's I feel his like call. Any, I feel like anyone that has quality backup defensive linemen uses them as opposed to other positions. Unless, yeah, I mean, like, it, yeah. does he let Elston make that decision mm-hmm. for him? I right. would imagine so, but, I, you know, we don't know. We can speculate about Marcus Freeman, but, you know, we have to see a year where he's actually calling the shots and we're studying every play every week. And we understand exactly how he goes about his, his business. Wreckers 33 hot. The message board is infatuated with Drew Eller, and he seems to be the pr- preference for the 2022 QB target. What are your thoughts on him as a prospect? He doesn't even have a Notre Dame offer. How does he fit into Notre Dame's 2022 QB recruiting approach with other targets? This is an interesting one because, you know, you have Angeli and Wimsat and you know, certainly Ty Simpson is most likely off the Clemson at the end of this month. But um, Allaire seems to be sort of like the hot guy that a lot of programs who aren't sure what they're doing at quarterback are going for. Um, Notre Dame, I think, feels pretty comfortable that they are going to get one of Angeli or Wimsat so they probably don't need to expand. That's just not saying that they shouldn't. I'm just saying that I I get the sense that their perspective. I felt since Tyler Buckner was in the fold that the 2022 and 2020 quarterbacks would not be as good or as important as the 2023. Does that make sense? Sure. It does. You know, I I just kind of looking at it that way. It was just, it's, it's hard to look and say, I mean, you wish, the equivalent of Tyler Buckner in 2022 was saying, I want to go compete with Tyler Buckner, but that's not the, uh, often how you're, it you're, pu- you're pushing for the philosophy of both and recruiting, both, yeah. right? I mean, yes. it's not either or, it's both. Um, you know, Wimsat would definitely be a both type of prospect um, watching his tape. Yeah, I, I, if I mispronounce his name, I apologize, Alara. He's an interesting, a really interesting cat because he's big, he's mobile. You know, you watch him play in high school and you, and you see some uh, Mahomes-type throws where he's, you know, uh, release point, every throwing angle, whatever he has to do in order to get it to his target, he does that. He's a bigger guy, uh, but he runs pretty well. I think Notre Dame feels – I don't know. I'm probably speaking out of turn here, but I think Notre Dame feels pretty good about his chances to get Angeli. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I understand for a lot of people that he doesn't necessarily move the needle because he's not a huge physical presence. I think he really knows how to play the quarterback position. Wimsat's, Wimsat's a better athlete. Um, they're going to get one of those guys. Uh, a, a lot of people are excited about Alaire. I get that. He has size and he's mobile and he can make a lot of throws. Mm-hmm. He's a real gunslinger, man. I mean, he'll let it, he'll let it fly from every arm ankle, whatever he has to do if he's under pressure. So um you know, I don't know. I mean, I could argue, I could argue for any one of those three. I'm not sure that any one of those three is clearly ahead of the other, other than Wimsat's just his just physical, flat out athleticism. 
Uh, but I like, you know, I mean, I think Angeli has really improved and Allaire is a very interesting candidate. I think it's hard for anyone, um, not anyone, for many Notre Dame fans with three years and a half years of Ian Book being a heady, underrated athlete without a great arm quarterback, and then seeing Drew Pine come in being a heady quarterback that knows everything about the sport but is physically unimposing in every way, and probably their offensive coordinator being the same thing when he was the quarterback for four years at Notre Dame. I think everybody just wants something different, and I, I do get that in recruiting. Like it, DJ Uyunglele comes in here, and he's the most incredible physical specimen you could find. And you, you know what I mean? There's just like there's a natural you want to go away from what you have when it's not perfect. I haven't pronounced Uyunglele in a while. I better just stay in practice because yes, it's, 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 it's coming up in September. Up. You think you think Angeli reminds people of Reese? I don't think he doesn't remind people of Reese this part of it. I just think it's, I mean, Pine does. I know Pine does. So I think it just adds to the whole. <laughs> uh, it it know, adds I, up on you. It adds I, up on I, your psyche. There are qualities that I like about all three of those yeah. guys. Obviously, Simpson's a guy that's a, a little bit of a cut above. But uh, uh, interesting. We'll see what happens there. Irish boy one, can you compare the recruiting prowess of Clark Lee versus Marcus Freeman? Why does Freeman seem to be so much better? I mean, Freeman uh, is an elite recruiter. Yeah, and I think personalities are a little bit different too. I mean, Freeman Freeman's a little bit more um, emotional in in sure. his his pitch, and 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 Lee is is a little bit more close to the vest with it. I guess I don't know. I haven't watched him recruit. I know none. I of would say have. this about like Clark. People in the Goog swear that he was a great recruiter. Um, I believe that I, because he's a really I, intelligent guy that can deliver a great message. And I mean, who responds more to intelligent messages than high school kids? Um, <laughs> you know, that's, I wasn't sure. Like I thought Clark Lee would be awesome with parents, um, but apparently he was really, really good with prospects too. I just, but like you said, his personality was not like, so like. Bursting with emotion. Up. No, that's just not how he is. Yeah, but so I think you 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 got a elite recruiter in Freeman replacing a a really good recruiter who I don't think was necessarily perceived that way by a lot of Notre Dame fans. <laughs> Probably because I mean you know adding to that is the story with with Tyson Ford and you know I, I for a long time a lot of people wanted Clark Lee the coach in waiting and now we're hearing more about the people that want Marcus Freeman as the coach in waiting. I think they're I think they're both I think they both have a chance to be really good head coaches but you know I mean why is one guy better than somebody else in something I mean you know there's a million reasons it's why is one running back better than another running back why is one assistant coach better than another assistant coach on the field in teaching you know I think Clark Lee's right up there with Marcus Freeman in a lot of respects Murphy, Murphy, Jay, go ahead Tuck. Murphy JD, I'm pretty confident I know what Notre Dame's defense would look like in a typical 4-3-4 alignment. If Freeman were to transition, at least in some circumstances, to 3-3-5 alignment, how do you think it would look with Notre Dame's current personnel? I'm not sure Notre Dame has anyone who would fit at the nose, and I def definitely wonder who the five defensive backs would be. O'Malley's wondering that, too. <laughs> they don't have five. I mean, unless you're including <laughs> Pryor as a fifth in a rover safety role. No, you know, Notre Dame played plenty of three down too, but it, it's in packages. They're not going to be a three, three, five first down team. They have, they don't have, they have too many defensive linemen to consider it. It's, it's inconceivable that you would take a three deep four man defensive line where you can play 12 guys in a football game and go to a three, three, five base. So I think it's just part of the packages. Like three, three, five is great on second and 10 and third and seven. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. No, I, I, you know, I, I think any time, any time you get a coordinator that comes in that's used a lot of three man front to a program that's been recruiting for a four man front, there's going to be some imperfect fits here. I think it's a really good question because yeah, I do too. I don't. I mean, I, I, I agree. I have a hard time seeing exactly how that aligns. That's why we're all looking forward to the spring because I'm sure that Marcus Freeman has many answers to that, but. He's a guy that, at least this is the impression we get, that, that he's going to play the players that fit. Right. I mean, the, the, well, he the, said it. the talents. Yeah, he <laughs> said it. Exactly. Yeah. He said it. The talents that they have, we're going to play play to those talents. And right now, they're a four-man four, four -man front 
you know, talent based, but, but there are, you can, there are certainly ways to add variations. I'm not exactly sure how you do it, especially with that. Like when you lose the Wusu Koromoa, you, yeah, you, know, you lose that, some options there oh, linebacker. Yeah. I, and I think, I mean, he kind of found the three, three, five alignment more often to be his best method in Cincinnati for what they had on the team too. I mean, they have better look, somebody put on the message board, you know, What's he going to do with these the talent defensive back? Cincinnati had more talented defensive backs than Notre Dame. That's true. for sure other than for the Kyle last two Hamilton, other, other than Kyle true. Hamilton. But he's yeah. one guy. I mean, right? They, I think he went with what he had. I mean, I'm, I'm blanking on some people, but if we name like the top twelve or thirteen defensive players right now, I bet you that you'd have seven defensive linemen. Uh, okay, so Foskey, yeah. Heinish, MTA, those three definitely. Justin Adamiola has, yeah. I mean, has always played well. Uh, Jason, when he's played. be close. I mean, when he plays. <laughs> Drew White, uh, you know, Bauer, Leah Fow, I think those are your top three pure talents at linebacker. You love Howard Cross. Yeah. Riley no Mills is only going to get better. I'm, Fosky, I mean, I'm this... a big fan of Riley Mills. Yeah. I mean, by the end of the year, if he said Botello was one of the 10 best guys on the defense, that wouldn't That wouldn't be me. a right, surprise right. at all. I, we know I just think there's the too many guys. I think the packet, I think you're going to see a million fronts. But Notre Dame's base D will be four down linemen, and then they'll play there's, guys all over the place. No, and then, in, yeah. you know, then in passing downs, well, anything goes then because it's right. a matchup game that it's been a matchup game for a long time now, and even more so now. Mm-hmm. Berardi Phillip. I haven't seen that name before, but it's a good question because I don't have an answer. As of today, who are your starting linebackers? I think we all have one or two. I mean, it's uh, like I would – I drew White for sure, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I shouldn't say for sure for anything, but I feel like for sure Drew White. Um, and then I'm not sure anything else, like that. I feel like it's the only thing I feel confident in is that Drew White will be one of the starting linebackers. Well, and if I, I would, were if I were choosing, uh, Leifau would be one of my starting yeah, linebackers because I figure you could put him somewhere in whatever whatever Freeman wants to run in various ways. Mm-hmm. You and can how find could, a way to put him in? And 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 speaking of going back to the previous question, when you do when you do put in a lineup with. You know, I don't know how many defensive backs you put on the field, but in passing situations, I mean, how is Lee if I'm not I mean, look look how he impacted right. the North Carolina game. Yeah. I mean, Howes couldn't throw he could not throw he there there was so much he couldn't throw in the second half because Lee if I was getting in passing lanes. So I, I would say White and Lee if I, and then again, depending upon how they line up, I think Kaiser should move outside, whether it, how, whether you call it Rover or outside linebacker or Sam or whatever you want to call it, you know, prior showed very well in, in brief glimpses. And we know that Mawala can play, but he's coming from coming back from a, yeah. uh, you know, an Achilles. I, we haven't even match, mentioned Shane Simon because we didn't, you know, we generally disagreed with him being in the starting lineup <laughs> last year, but I mean, Clark Lee made those decisions and obviously he was doing things well. So yes. it's a great question because, there are positions that are up for grab. I don't know that Drew White's position is up for grabs. And I think Leah Fowl certainly has the physical capabilities to be in the lineup. But after that, you know, it's, it's just really hard to know. Right. That's why they have spring practice. I'm sure Mark, I'm sure Marcus Freeman has a lot of ideas, but he doesn't want to go through another spring without having spring practice. The interesting thing is that Bo Bauer almost is just going to be in the same role with spelling drew white right i mean you can't play a four three or a three three five with them both now you could play a three four but nobody's not going traditional three four i mean for there not going to be a three gap you know it'll be a three down team so it's really weird now i know bo bauer played what 35 percent, 40 percent of the downs maybe last year so it's he has plenty of time to play but yeah that's I, what, look i don't i don't want to talk myself out of drew white but my my understanding is that marcus freeman's defense is much more like one gapping and attacking uh, for the linebacker position than Clark Lee's was, which was a lot more complicated and cerebral, which fit Drew White. Uh, Bo Bauer is a get after it linebacker. So who's to say that he doesn't have a Well, that's role? true. I, I, I mean, don't know. How can, you, how can you argue with the way Bo Bauer played last year? He was outstanding. Yeah, he played well last yeah. year. I mean, he was really, really good. He did good, play a so. lot. He played a lot too. Like people yeah. think he's a backup. He played a lot. He Yeah. Drew White's snaps I, you know, went down by 200. I, I don't know. Oh, really? From the yeah. previous year? Yeah, they didn't do any backup. Did I don't, yeah, I mean, well, I, that makes sense. I don't know how you put White and Bauer on the field together, but 
as we as we sit here right now, those are your two most accomplished linebackers. <laughs> yes, that's how you put them on the field together. Right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you just did it, Tim. Congratulations. Exactly. But exactly. That's... Question from Jay Jude: If Tosh Baker and Andrew Kristofic really show out in spring practice, which one of Josh Lud and Jarrett Patterson go inside at one of the guard spots, or are those two pretty much locked in at tackle? I mean, Patterson's hmm. got to be locked in at tackle, right? I guess why he's he's not going to guard Jarrett Patterson. He's still the best center yeah. on the team. He's not going to go to guard. <laughs> like it's, I don't. I guess. I guess if Notre Dame is absolutely crippled at guard, and both of those guys are really good at tackle, then he would. He's probably the only guy that could go do it. But I just think those are your tackles for this. I just think those are your tackles this year. Pete, I I agree. I I don't. Tosh Baker starting at tackle. I, I wouldn't. Right. That wouldn't shock me. It's intriguing because um, we know his potential. Right. Yeah, Chris Christophe, I think is obviously he's got some strength to to get caught up on, but you know, you'd think he'd probably be caught up on that by now. Um so I think the the show out part of it, I think they would have to really show out in spring ball. Um uh, like, like, to like the a point that like it would a, surprise me. Like a Patterson did two years ago where it's like, yeah. okay, no doubt he's gotta be one of our starting five. Or like I, I know, it's the, like but if, but if you remember that spring ball, like day one, he was the starting center. No, that's true. That's true. You know, it wasn't like he won the job during spring. I mean, Hainsey took it. Hainsey took it as an early enrollee through the summer. Remember that he, it was Eichenberg yeah. and Kramer. And it's amazing that Eichenberg did not win that job. It is incredible right now when you think about it, considering yeah, what I he agree. did the other years. I know. Yeah, no, it's true. We'll talk about Eichenberg a little bit later in, in, a, in a question about the draft. And maybe I'll have somewhat of an explanation for that. But I mean, I know they plan on Jared Patterson playing left tackle. So that means Zeke Corral's at center. They've determined in the past that Lug's better at, ta- at tackle. So you would think that, the, you know, I mean, I would look at, like, are you going to put Patterson at guard and Tosh Baker at left tackle? I'm not sure that you would do that. I mean, I, could you put mm. Christophic inside? I know he took some, some uh, cleanup snaps late in games at guard. But I think that's uh, just because – the guys that were backups like Tosh Baker couldn't go in at guard. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which, like, yes, which might no, not be do. the case anymore, right? Like Tosh right. Baker, they might determine Tosh Baker is one of their five best athletes. And like, it's okay to have huge guards. They've had them over the last few years. Yeah. That's an, that's, that would be the best case scenario for the spring. If they're like, well, we got to get Tosh Baker in there. Right. That is the best case spring scenario. Yeah, right. We got to play know, this guy. That's Although that's I would be of. surprised if Patterson played left guard. If the best way to align, if if Tosh Baker were that good, I mean, my first reaction to the question was, well, hell, they'll put Tosh Baker at guard if he's that good. Yeah. But I, yeah. but now that we're talking about, it, I'm not sure that that would be the case. So, that uh, offensive line and linebackers, two things that we'll be looking forward to seeing if they allow us into to spring practice. Brian, seven thirty nine. Any thoughts on realistic future contributions from Hunter Spears, Nana Osafa Metza, and Alexander Ehrensberger? We should point out as much younger. Is Spears moved to the offensive line permanent? I would I would think that Spears has moved to the offensive line is permanent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and they're I mean they're recruiting the way they're recruiting on the defensive line now. Uh, a guy that I had intended to mention in segment one, Anthony Lucas. That's a possibility that's going to come to Notre Dame with with Rubio. I mean, they are really upgrading the D line. So I think Spears is for better or for worse, is going to be on the offensive line. I Before Nana Safo Mensa's injury, I know, or I believe I know, that they did not feel like he was progressing at the pace that they had hoped. So now add an injury onto it, uh, and, and right now I don't see him in their plans. And as far as Aaronsberger, I think it's just too early to know. Yeah. We need to see him in spring practice. He made a play against South Florida. A lot of people got really excited about that. It was good to see, but it's just too early for us to know about Aaronsberger. Hey, if you don't include the snap yep. minimum, Pete Sampson and Tim Priester, these are the number one, two, and three players for Notre Dame last year. Jeremiah Usu koromoa Kyle Hamilton, and Alexander Aaronsberger, and I'll just leave that right there with his seven snaps. <laughs> That's how he graded. <laughs> You have to click snap minimum to get the uh, the guys that qualify. Ah, I get it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You had me a little confused there for a second. I get it. <laughs> That's 14 out of quality it. snaps. <laughs> it's, I mean, Tim, you mentioned like how well they're recruiting a defensive tackle. It's like, well, offensive line recruiting is also going quite well. well that's true. So it's, that's true. 
it's just it's a position in really both positions. It's a place where just because you're a four star doesn't mean you're not going to get beat out by two or the three well, other four stars. That's true. That's true. I mean, we're talking about you got to find guards. Hunter Spears, be yes. good enough, healthy enough, and strong enough, and you can win the job. He is in the one position now, being an offensive guard one year into his life of football. There's much better chance of him playing than defensive tackle next year right. or nose tackle. Like well, let's, that's let's, fifth, five deep at defensive tackle. Um, Tom, Tom Clements, who I did the feature on uh, a couple of weeks ago. I also did a story last week with him talking about Joe Moore and he made the comment, you know, Joe Moore could get the best out of guys that weren't necessarily great athletes. You know, if you're a quarterback, if you can throw it, you can throw it. If you can't, you can't. If you're a wide receiver, if you can catch it, you can catch it. If you can't, you can't. If you can run, you can run. If you can't, you can't. With an offensive lineman, you don't have to be the best athlete out there to be a very, very productive offensive lineman. So Hunter Spears, go win the job. I mean, there's an opportunity to do that. I don't see that happening right now. But again, we haven't seen, we need to see spring practice, see if that's a possibility. I see gold. You guys have mentioned the merits of moving MTA and or Mills to strong side end, but what about Howard Cross? He's obviously the smallest of the interior guys, but he's known for his quickness and tenacity. What do you think about his 2020 season and what are your thoughts on his future in the defensive line rotation? I think he's more known for his strength and powerful hands and long arms. And I think that they've made a commitment to him inside and I don't see that changing. However, a three man front strong side end, you know, again, we're, we're, I mean, we're kicking around ideas here and guessing as to what we're going to see in the spring, but I think they keep him inside. I'm all too. for like the, the guy with the longer arms and better length being outside and the shorter arms, quicker, well, I get powerful that. I dancing get, bear on the inside. No, I get that. But I mean, bear, right? MTA, we, we, you know, he could slide outside in a three man front. Riley Mills yeah. is capable. I think of whatever you want to do with him inside or outside. I don't, I just don't have the answer here, but I just, I feel like they made a commitment. Okay. Cross is going to be interior defensive line player. And again, going back to an earlier question, how much based upon the personnel that they have, how much three man front are they really going to run? Yeah. uh, At least in the short term, Irish 1490, assuming the 2021 season, Tim, did you get a chance to comment on that? I'm sorry. Uh, No, I've been with you guys. It's uh, I, I, they, I mean, they moved cross to nose tackle when they needed it last year when Jacob Lacey was banged up. I just think they like how he fights inside. You know, he was he was playing nose tackle at, in games right. last year. Yeah, like, it's playing. just weird. It's strange. They to moved think him. Of. They he went from defensive end to three technique to nose tackle. Yeah, so I think they like the way he battles inside. Yeah, Irish fourteen ninety. Assuming the twenty twenty one season is back to normal and fans can attend games out of the four true road games: Florida State, Virginia Tech, Virginia, and Stanford, and only. Picking one, which game are you recommending Notre Dame fans make the road trip for and why? O'Malley, I'll, I'll, we agree, so I'll, I'll let you answer for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you get to go out to, Palo- to Northern California to hang out, you can just <coughs> enjoy a little parking easily and go into the football game and watch football and drive home. Yeah, Stanford's a fun trip. Uh, hanging out in San Francisco and or Palo Alto and walking around that campus just makes you feel good about yourself. It's a nice time. If you're looking for a college football experience, that would not be the choice. <laughs> um, you got to go to Virginia Tech if you haven't been for the college football experience because I like how it's on campus. Um, obviously, there's the element of Enter Sandman and everything at night. Um, Florida State is a heck of a place to visit. Tallahassee, I've been there a few times. Um, good quality surroundings in the Tallahassee area, depending on your age and uh, – status in life as well. And uh, I am looking forward to going to Virginia because I missed the 2015 game. So I really look forward to that one. Oh, that was a good one. Yes. It yeah, was a, yeah, it was okay, wasn't it? It was a good one, though. <laughs> I don't know that you'll find the trip to be anything necessarily special. The 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 uh, the turf in that stadium is absolutely beautiful. It's you said a, it was a long walk from the parking lot. Yeah, you said it was quaint. It also though, stands like, out. Why Virginia Tech was long? like, yeah, Virginia. Yeah. I, I remember being particularly long. You're like cut through the woods. You're like, where am I going? Like, it, oh, I remember stadium. now. Yeah, that was a long. Yeah, that was a long walk. Uh, no doubt about it. Well, I, you know, I know some people that went to Virginia Tech a couple of years ago said that they weren't that impressed with the atmosphere. I was. I, I was mean, too. I, I, just yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I thought you know it was. I, I'm not sure what 
some were looking for, but I thought it was a was a really cool experience. Florida State, I'd rather visit in November than the beginning of September when it's that's a good 90. call because Labor Day Louisville was really hot. So Labor Day Florida yeah, State is yeah. gonna be really hot. It's that's gonna be that's really, a tough one. Really hot. Stanford, we've made that trip a million times. So I mean, that's, I love it. I love yeah. I love going to Northern California for a weekend in November, and I love going to Southern California for a weekend. <laughs> in November. And hopefully all of that, uh, is back. And I'm, I'm for our readers. Um, I should be uh, getting an interview with, uh, with Jack Swarbrick here very soon. So these are some of the things, the schedule, those things, looking forward to some of the topics that we should be discussing. Worst game atmosphere though, to chime in. Cause you might be looking for a game atmosphere too. Stanford's, I mean, the, Stanford is quaint. It's awesome. You pull in, it's beautiful. You walk up, it's calm. It, re- it you walk re- out. It, yeah, it reeks of Northern California. Yeah, it's it, really it is beautiful. relaxing and a great afternoon. Um, but I, only if you're like going with people that are looking for a relaxing, great afternoon, because the other games are a much better college football experience. Like Rowan, staying in Roanoke was fun. I stayed with my friends in Roanoke. That, that was a that was a yeah. college town. Now Virginia Tech yeah. game atmosphere is is right. really pretty special. PD Dumont, I'm looking at the schedule and I have a hard time finding a loss. What am I missing? Objectivity. Yeah. <laughs> you cut and paste this question from every other off-season podcast that we've done every year. Last no, year's the I, only one yeah. there wasn't one with Clemson. Clemson was not that question. Did no, not but tell me. I mean, Clemson comes here in November. I'm having a hard time finding a loss. I mean, I I, I get it. I get it, PJ Dumont. I, I apologize for being such a smart ass, but um, you know, I, I Pete, you and I discussed this in the airport coming back from the Rose Bowl. If there's ever a year where Brian Kelly is going to lose to an unranked team, this would be it because you don't know the state of the offensive line. You don't know the state of the secondary. The wide receiver core, which has a lot of athletic ability and talent, is still young. They lost, you know, all their frontline guys there. So and then here's the other thing. Do we do we know what those teams have coming back this year? I mean, I haven't studied it yet. I maybe PG P D Dumont has and understands that those aren't very good teams, but I, I, you know, again, I, I, I look at, I look at things like a coach sometimes and going to Florida state and playing Purdue's offense and having to play Wisconsin and Cincinnati's a good program and going to Virginia tech and USC is getting better and North Carolina is still North. You know, I mean, I get where I'm, where I'm coming from here. I just can't assume that you walk in and win those games, which generally speaking, Brian Kelly has been winning those games in recent years, the last four years. I'm doing a first look at the schedule this week, and I wanted to point something out. It was pulled from Monday Musings. It's got too big. I'm going with Jack Freeman. He does not like the musing to get too big. It can become a story. So you, Jack, there it is. So the three hardest games of the last two years, 2020 and 2021, Alabama clearly does not count, right? Okay. They're not. You have to. If Jordan goes to the playoffs and plays Alabama, good. They can play another hard game against Alabama. That's fine. They had a great year. The 2020 ACC championship, because that was scheduled as soon as you were going to be good the Clemson game and at North Carolina are the three hardest games in 2020 and 2021. Wow. Those are way harder than any three games you can pick out here. However, eight of the next 10 are 2021. Okay. Yeah. So you get a trip up game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, remember how we felt about Virginia coming to Notre Dame in 2019? Yeah. Like, like really good team like you're better than them but not like a ton better but like just a good team that could get you on a bad day i feel like notre dame plays like seven virginias this year they do there's eight games i included florida state because you have a new offensive One of them line. Is virginia yeah well, and, and, and <laughs> yeah, virginia right. tech i mean you easily oh, yeah. could have lost to virginia tech in 2019 now you're going yeah. to their place i mean i just don't i just i look i I learned to look at schedules the way Lou Holtz taught me when I was a young reporter. You, you have to be, you have to be aware of everything that can go wrong. And there are things that can go wrong there. I mean, Georgia tech is getting better. Notre Dame didn't, Notre Dame didn't kick their butt last year. There's more that can go wrong, as- but you, sh- there's more that could go wrong, but it's just not the top. Like, yeah, the score that Georgia Notre Dame should have beaten. George Tech yeah, yeah, but I'm saying like there's plenty more that could go wrong because if you agree with me that eight of the most ten next eight of the next ten most difficult are from 2021, there's a lot that can go wrong in eight games. But you don't. I get what he P D Dumont is saying. If you look at the Clemson game last year, you're like, well, that's a problem. <laughs> then if you think, yeah. well, if they win that game or if they lose a close one, they have to play them again. 
Like that isn't a problem. That's a bigger problem that as we right. found out and knew that's no, a I bigger agree. problem. And then North Carolina mm-hmm. preseason, it's hard to do preseason looks because we thought Pittsburgh would be just as good as North Carolina in the preseason, you know? Um, I included Pittsburgh in this because I was trying to do preseason. Well, they, didn't have paper, a, they didn't have a quarterback when they played Notre Dame, which yeah. gave them no chance. There's just like USC. There's a, there's a bunch of solid teams that Notre Dame is going to be favored against. And you and Pete made a great point in the airport. They're favored. You got to win them all though. You got to win all the games where you're only favored by right. eight, eight points or less probably, as opposed to, you know, what you can get ahead of some other teams. By. I mean, mm-hmm. look, if, if you'd said Notre Dame's, if Notre Dame was returning Last year's team this year, I think Dumont would be onto something. I, agree. I would, I would be like, boom, this is a year to make to go twelve and zero and make the playoff. But four new starters on the offensive line, no Sukor Moa, new no new quarterback. They just they have a they have a lot to get figured out on the fly, and sometimes you you have a flat tire along the way. Andy Yinzer, over under three and a half Irish players drafted in the first one hundred picks of the NFL draft. Eichenberg and JOK are your guarantees. Then I think it gets interesting with Ogan Deji, Banks, and Tremble. Three Tim, rounds gone. I, three ooh. rounds gone. I would say the over not, under. Not a full three. Not a full three. I mean, it's. 30, 60, 92. 90. Yeah, that's about it, right? There's 32 teams. Right. So there'll be 96 Okay. Picks. Yeah, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I say uh, under three and a half in the first 100 picks. If that's my question, I, I <laughs> just gonna answer that the question. Is question. Yeah. I'm not gonna try to extrapolate it all. I just say under. I agree. It, I think yeah, all I mean, three. Clearly, Wusu Koromoa is in there. We did a we did offense and defense with Dan Shanka last week, and he got torched because he said second round for Wusu Koromoa. If you read the whole thing that he said that I wrote, he said he's one of the best 32 players in the draft, and he could very well go in the first round. But he's talking about a, a, a slightly undersized outside linebacker in the NFL. First round draft choice. Not every team is inclined to go ahead and pick a player like that. Now, I think, I mean, Usu Koromoa is a rare breed, a special talent. And I think he will go in the first round. But I understood where Dan Schenck was was coming from there. As far as Eichenberg, there are at least four offensive tackles, maybe five or six that are rated ahead of him. And yet, if you look at last year's NFL draft, there were four offensive tackles that were chosen within the first 13 picks of the draft. Yeah, six, he, he's going to the top in the 100. first round. Yeah, yeah he's, go, he's yeah, going yeah. in the top 100. He lacks a little bit of ballast in his backside, so to speak. Uh, gets Still gets pushed off the ball. He didn't have trouble with speed rushers. Uh, but, you know, that, that lower body strength, I would imagine that's something that he's really preparing for you know, as he gets ready for the, the combine or whatever form of combine there is in, in pro day. But other guys, I mean, I think I don't think Banks goes within the top 100, but he goes within the top 150. Perhaps. Yeah, I was going to say, he goes in the next 50. Um, you know, Tremble is the one, and uh, again, a lot of people objected uh, about Tremble because Shanka said um, free agent, which, I, which again, I do, th- I do think he's going to get drafted. But he's a great blocker. They didn't catch the football very well last year and doesn't have superior length so i mean i i understand where he's come from but i do think they'll get drafted but i would you know nobody else hazy kramer Skronik, book mckinley Wright, hayes mcleod crawford those guys aren't top 100 players so i think I the more I, say, I think the interesting question is how many guys get drafted we will we'll wait to do that until it gets close to the draft but you could get a lot of notre dame guys sneaking in that seventh round this year <laughs> that, that, that's, are, that's a compliment there, that's a compliment, there really actually. are a yeah. ton of notre dame candidates for the sixth and seventh round yeah. no doubt about it yeah, i agree nd famous amos best guess at what percentage of fans will be allowed in attendance in 2021 and also another question this is a real pick me up alabama clemson ohio state and oklahoma will be in the playoff change my mind uh, I can't, I can't change your mind about that. And the no. famous Amos uh, best guess. It's completely a guess, uh, especially before I talked to Jack Swarbrick about it. <laughs> yeah, wait, but, wait, wait, um, wait on that one, Tim. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I think that he's going to be guessing a little bit too, but probably yeah. have you probably with a better idea because, you know, spring practice, barring a, barring a significant outbreak, we're going to have spring practice this year. We may not be attending any of them, but there are going to be 15 spring practices this this yeah, point, right. You're gonna have an NCAA tournament. You can have yes. spring practice for crying. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's yeah. So 
Uh, but to project how many people will be in the stands in September and October, more than last year, oh, but yes. not full. Not full? <laughs> Half? I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know what you base your what does what does on. half do for distancing does that really help you distance is it become yeah that's the thing I, I feel like if if you're going to do half just do full almost like there isn't that much of a difference between them we don't know don't the know. effect we don't know the effect of the vaccine we don't know the the impact of variations of the virus See, I feel like this is like More the wrong year. podcast for that. Discussion. Last March, no, last March, Irish Illustrated Insiders on the cutting edge of social distancing in March, and I feel like we brought the people what was going to happen, the pandemic, and now I feel like we're just flailing away, and we can't do it anymore. New podcast is needed for that one. We're yeah. not. Uh, we were able to use common sense last year. <laughs> it worked out I mean, for us. <laughs> it, it would make it would make sense that there will be more, but I, that is such I an interesting question. Many. What I mean, how many more do you let in when all of a sudden you're just well? Why not just let 20,000 more than that in then? I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I I don't know. They would have to study the outbreaks of A&M. Didn't A&M have – how many did A&M have for that Alabama game? Remember that the looked SEC, like more the than – The SEC functions the Florida, a the little A&M bit different. Florida right? game was, A&M Florida. was yeah. so packed that Dan Mullen was like, we need to pack the swamp um, <laughs> after the game. I don't I mean, I think the next – three months like you don't need to decide i remember doing a story on ticketing last august and basically notre dame's position was we can decide we we don't want to wait until basically a week and a half before the game but if we need to wait that late we can on how many people get in so it's i mean september they could conceivably decide on september 1 um which feels like a lifetime away now they they could be but you, i mean with the money the money lost last to. year with sure. yeah i mean yeah. i think they want to do everything they possibly can in advance to know how many you know that that they can have there or, or to expand from what they did last year but uh, a lot of variables to deal with before that question from i i'll never tweet can you tap into your crystal ball and see if there is any shot marcus freeman stays through Brian Kelly's retirement from Notre Dame. Certainly hope not. Means Notre Dame didn't make the playoff. That's yeah, that your best your best shot at Marcus Freeman being around is for their defense not to be as good as you hoped. I, I don't know how to No way. No, there is no no way. No way. <laughs> if if Notre Dame as Marcus if Marcus Freeman is coordinating defense the way we think he can at Notre Dame, he's gonna be 10 and 2 at worst. And ten and two at worst in his next two in two thousand twenty two and twenty three when they have Clemson Ohio State, you know I mean you could lose those because games and still are, be great at your job. There are no lateral moves for him to make anymore. No. He will not. He will. He will get a job by coordinating really good Notre Dame defenses. I think if you said you got three years out of Marcus Freeman, you'd be thrilled, right? Oh gosh. Oh gosh. I mean, I would predict if crystal ball. I tap two years. What do you guys tap for your crystal ball? Just I would. It I would say two years. Three years is would be a godsend for Notre Dame football. Probably two. Yeah. Hit it, Tim. I'm <laughs> just laughing at the question. What? <laughs> my, my, all right, Mikey Gailey, you got the best question of the day. What will be the next coaching position Brian Kelly makes up to give his loyal assistance a pay raise? Uh, <laughs> that's good. That's, that's, my, that's Mikey Gelv, I Mikey believe, Gally. by the way. Nice but, yeah, um, He's invited to the next podcast. Uh, you know, can <laughs> Reese get another? I guess Reese could be a, become an associate head coach at some point. Ta- uh, Lance Taylor, I guess, could get another bump up. And I don't know. It's a good question. I put it in there because I thought you want Valley would get a yeah, kick. Yeah. Out of it. <laughs> I like that. I'm glad I got to read that one. That's good. <laughs> uh, this one from Dashing Domer. On a different note, we are going. We're going <laughs> to. We're going to wrap up with uh, with this one from Dashing Domer. Is it really a journalist's job to uncover what is wrong in the world? Bring it to light and highlight it. Are there other ways a journalist can serve their community? <laughs> uh, well, part of our job is to uncover what's wrong in the college football Notre Dame slash Notre Dame football world. I, I get that. Um, but there's a balance. And most of what we do is to try to provide an insight into the people that, you know, why they do what they do. Um is this in reference to something I am missing? Is my next well, question? I don't, I, <laughs> okay. I mean, I, <laughs> am I missing? Did I miss the story on Irish Illustrated or the Athletic that, that I need to well, read right now? I don't. <laughs> I mean, I was sure. 
I, I was told to, that I needed to grow a pair in my coverage of Notre Dame football a few weeks ago. And, and uh, I mean, I don't really know what to say about that. I think there are instances where you certainly question what the coaches and players are doing. Um, it's a little bit hard to question recruiting when it's something that we never actually witness, uh, especially when you just land a top 120 defensive end whether the head coach spoke to him or not. But again, I think, again, we're trying to end on a little bit lighter note here and that's why it was, was chosen, but I think it's a real balancing act for us. And, and um, I think Irish Illustrated does a pretty good job of providing that balance. I've always found like, it's interesting to try to explain why something happened. Sometimes that's why something worked. Sometimes it's why something didn't work. That's why right. I became a sports writer, Pete. I yeah, mean, and I, it's from not... the earliest stage, I I wanted to describe what is hap- why is it yeah. what's happening and why is it happening. I mean, I I was able to do I'm, I didn't do any of these during the pandemic, but like, and you guys have done similar things. Like you talk through a play with a player or a coach and explain why you read it this way, why you made this throw, why you made this cut, you know, why, you know, you made this adjustment. And it's not to second guess anything. It's to to learn and try to understand what's happening. Um, And I think the best coaches and players, the ones that are the most confident can sit there and explain their craft to you without feeling defensive about it or trying to push back again. And so it's, I think those, those kind of stories are awesome. Um, because I, I learn a ton as a reporter, and I would really like to think that the reader learns a ton as a wow. reader. No yeah. doubt about it. That's when Julian Love takes you through four pass breakups in one game against Ball State. It becomes interesting, even though it was Ball State. He explains yeah. why these why all these things happen and why it didn't happen on one. Like mm-hmm. it's he knows what he's doing. He's explaining things to you, and there's a couple things where you look at it and you're like, really? Because I would have thought you would have done that. And he's like, no, you can't because. And then he explains why the because is. I mean, it's just. There's a lot more going on. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that there's a segment of the fans that they want to know the reason why. And I look at as athletic competition and they look at as blame somebody from the team that we're cheering for. And, and usually I, it's an expendable person, such as a fifth year senior quarterback or a head coach that's been there 11 years. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I you know, I and again, I think yes. I, I mean, no, I think no one's blaming I, Tyler Buckner for his first loss and trying to get rid of him. I promise you that. Right. But loss number yeah. seven could be a time where somebody wants to blame I, him. I, I well, that's that, like I was just gonna say, like, did, if you if this is really about the Tyson Ford story, like, I I still think it's interesting why Notre Dame recruited him the way that it did, and that sort of came out in the Elston Polian press conference the other week, where Polian talked about it's it's on the assistant coaches to bring the head coach in, in those instances. Like, that's not saying that's right or wrong, but it's interesting that like that's Notre Dame's approach to me, um, and I think that we should be able to write that and discuss that without it turning into like, kind of a big defensive spat. Yeah, I, I think in general the whole world that looks at college football. Um, you know, I mean, I think athletic competition, I, 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 I try to give equal respect to the team that they're playing against and the players that were recruited and the coaches that are coaching them. And many times those guys are just as good, if not better than the Notre Dame players and even coaches at times that that's an athletic competition. That's why we do what we do. That's why we go to games because we want to see who will win and why, but I, but some people get so, so worked up about their own team that it has to be your own team that's screwing up. And I don't think that that's sometimes that's the case, but I don't think that that's the way, generally speaking, athletic competition on this level, on the level that we're talking about, there are a lot of great players out there. There are a lot of coaches out there and they, and they guess what? They have fans that want their team to win too. Got it? <laughs> Noted. <laughs> well, then why does Alabama always win, Tim? Yes. <laughs> because they have better players and better coaches. Well, their fans have more else. fun. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I see. You know, I don't know about you guys, but you ever drive around South Bend and you drive? I was, I was just, I was in Elkhart the other day. So east of South Bend, driving back to Mishawaka. And, you know, you're kind of in the country, day road, you know, you're familiar. 
There's there's somebody with an Alabama flag. Did you grow oh, up in Alabama? Ev- they're flag? everywhere. They are they're everywhere. everywhere. Oh, they're Did everywhere. You, uh, so you mean you grew up you grew up in Alabama and moved to Northern Indiana? That's why you're an Alabama fan, <laughs> or could it be because they win 35 out of 36 games? I gotta say, I gotta I gotta give credit the house I see on Twickingham that's flown a Nebraska flag for the last 15 years because well, that is a lot of dedication. Okay, well that's a that's a legit Nebraska fan yeah. for whatever reason. But I'm but with I just, you. Like you see Alabama <laughs> stickers now, and you're like, wait a minute, come on. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's I, I want people to know that haven't been to South Bend in a couple of years. They are everywhere. The Alabama fans. It probably got worse too. Yeah, I mean, I you know everybody likes a winner, I guess, but. I was a Chicago Cubs fan since 1969, and thank God they won the World Series in 2016, because I, they're not going to win. They're not going to win anytime <laughs> soon. So, anyway, I had fun doing this podcast. Hope you guys did too. Hope our listeners did as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back on Monday, February 22nd.